and good afternoon to all my friends from different part of the world and uh, uh, i welcome you all on behalf of uh, acns yns webinar series which we are conducting every second and fourth sunday for the whole purpose of education especially for the young neurosurgeons and especially from the low uh, resource countries so today we have yet another uh, session wherein uh, we have professor uh, tangji as our uh, invited uh, guest faculty and uh, dr sneha chitra who is our invited uh, young neurosurgeon faculty mm -hmm. professor yoko kato as usual our uh, the pillars of acns uh, who is the president of uh, our acns committee and for today's session we have uh, professor soichi oya as the chairperson who's professor at department of neurosurgery saitama medical center and uh, the two discussants are uh, professor alexander wozniak who's the uh, chief and president of ukrainian association of Neuro neurological surgeons and professor pavad kitra who's the president of neurosurgical association of afghanistan and along with me uh, we have a uh, co-moderator dr ashish kumar Dr. Ben uh, Ng and uh, Dr. Mohammad Mainul Islam and of course Dr. Liu Bun Singh uh, as a co-moderator uh, with me. So I would request before starting, I would request Professor Yogatoto to say a few opening uh, words for the today's webinar, and then we'll uh, start. So welcome everybody. So today we have a very nice uh, the guest. Uh, of course, uh, the chief guest is uh, Tanje, and uh, we've been friends. Maybe more than I think uh, uh, so far, maybe 30 years. Is it okay? 20 years. <laughs> 20, not 30. Okay. No, sir. No, I'm not so old. <laughs> I'm oh, still uh, young. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, thank you very much for accepting our, our uh, invitation. And also, the year talk is very uh, is serious, very difficult the part in, in the brain. So we all are looking forward to your lecture. And also, the, the Sneha is a rising star of the female neurosurgeon in the world, I think. So I think she is uh, one of the uh, staff of the YNS committee, and he is very hardworking. And today, uh, the hard topic is very popular, so the VP shunt for uh, the NPH. But uh, still, we have a lot of uh, the, the problem, and uh, so we need to listen to your lecture. So thank you very much for today's uh, uh, join. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much, Professor Yokopato. So before we start, we'd like to take a permission from the chairperson for today's session. I would request Professor Soichi Oya to say a few words before we start. Uh, and also introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Tangji, as he's also his friend. So Professor Soichi Oya. OK. And um, hi. Uh... Good. Uh, how are you today? Uh, uh, today, uh, we our seminar is having a professor Tan Jie, um, who is a professor of the uh, Department of Neurosurgery, Shangfu Hospital, Shangwu Hospital, and Capital uh. Medical University, Shi Chen. Right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not confident about the Chinese pronunciation, but uh, I I was kind of practicing it <laughs> before this <laughs> seminar. And uh, um, well, uh, let me introduce uh, Professor uh, Jie. Um, I first met him uh, in Cleveland in 2010. And uh, last year, maybe two years ago, um, I happened to come to uh, meet a young lady who was studying at the Waseda University, which is a very famous university in Japan. Uh, her mother had a brain tumor. Uh, it was a uh, uh, gliomer on the uh, left side, looking uh, the uh, so-called low-grade glioma. And uh, she was planning to, um, you know, have her uh, uh, treated in Japan. But uh, I recommended her, you know, you should see a Professor, you know, uh, Tan Jie uh, in Beijing. Uh, he's a specialist of brain tumor surgery, and uh, he kindly accepted. Uh, my offer, and uh, now I I heard from from her that uh, she is uh, getting you know better, and she uh, returned to her normal life. And uh, I have to say thank you uh, to uh, Professor you know Jie. Thank you very much. And today uh, he is going to talk about the uh, brainstem cavernous malformation, uh, which is a well-known disease for uh, you know. 
uh, its complexity and the uh, the the, two, the the region has many issues regarding the uh, you know the treatment indication when to operate on when not to operate on and uh, how to use the you know you know the imaging studies monitoring how to approach and uh, I'm very much looking forward to his lecture today. So the, please uh, start your lecture, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Jie. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for, for your kind invitation and having me to share my knowledge about the, this the brainstem cavernous malformation. Thank you, Professor Kato, Oya, oh, yeah, and, and other the, the, the faculties. So I will start my the topic. So. So you can you see my slide? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So my, my topic is, is a new technology used for, for the brainstem cavernous malformation. So this is a uh, cavernous malformation is a well-known uh, the, the disease we have, and also the brainstem is a very complex and deep-seated uh, locations. So it, it was it was quite a challenging in the before, but now there are some still some questioning we should we will face in our the, the diagnosis and also uh, for the treatment. Diagnosis may be maybe easy, but the, the timing for the the treatment is sometimes quite challenging and some the controversial. So now. This is um, uh, my, my department, my uh, institution in Xuanwu Hospital. It's uh, in downtown of Beijing. It's a very beautiful, the uh, brain shaped buildings. So I hope for, ho hopefully in the future, you can come to for exchange our the knowledge. And this is uh, the uh, operation room we have now for the our the daily, uh, operation for the neurosurgery. We have a very good um, the facilities for the surgery. We have uh, the, the microscope, we have the navigation system, and also we have the ultra, ultrasound. And also we have the staffs for the monitoring. And the, we have very the beautiful the screens we can see. And also the nurse, the uh, anesthetist, and the other the, uh, the team the members can see what's happening under the microscope. And beside this uh, yellow gate, that is the magnet. So this is the intraoperative MRI, the suite. So now we have a very good uh, the facilities for our the uh, for capabilities to handle the all kinds of the, the lesions in the brain. So this is much better than before than our the, the pioneers. We can see clearly before the operation, and also we can see the lesions intraoperatively. So this is to make our the neurosurgeon become the, the more powerful than before. And the, and this is um, the as a schematic drawing we have based on our uh, uh, anatomies. It published uh, more than ten years ago. It have a very beautiful the drawings and the indications of where we can access to the brainstem. And also from the this kind of, we can know the uh, anatomy very clearly. And, and with our understanding that we can distract, we can to get the information, more details before the operation. We can see the fibers, we can see the legions. So with all this kind of the advanced image, guided the technology. It makes our the neurosurgeon more powerful and uh, more precisely than before. And for the uh, uh, cavernous malformation, we know it once was called cryptic or awkward vascular malformation because it was unseen. We cannot see that in the D stuff, in the DSA, but with the CT scan and the MRI, we can see it very, very clearly. And before it have a, before it, it have from the symptom. So this made our, the we can have a very good diagnosis than before and see clearly. And also our knowledge about the malformation conformation is still evolved. In the past, we think it is stable, 
but actually it will grow bigger and bigger. And the, even with uh, we call it, it's a proliferating uh, cavernous vascular the tumors. So, and also with our, our, our understanding, the genetic studies show there's some of the genetic mutations in part of the genome. So in the in our group, our the uh, colleague in the vascular uh, group unit, we have some the genetic change, and this remind and give some clue. Maybe we in the future we can have some of the the medication to treat this the lesions without the surgery or with the surgery. We can have a better the outcomes for our patient, and um, we we know in the patient. We have uh, two panels. One is uh, sporadic. It means maybe this is only a single lesion inside the brain, but there's a, a, another kind of the matters of the uh, the lesions is uh, multiple. It means it's a, it's a more than maybe two or three or even tens of the lesions inside of the brain, even in the brain stem, even in the uh, spinal cord. So for the multiple the lesions. It uh, have uh, the family of the uh, predominance and have some genetic change. And this is uh, two kinds of the, the lesions. On the left is single. So it's a sporadic, it's more common than the uh, family of the multiple one on the right side. So we can see there's a, a lot of the lesions in the MRI sequence. But here, we I want to emphasize for the young doctors, this we should use the different the MRI the sequence. It's a GRE sequence, or the SWI. It's more sensitive to see the lesions in the MRI. It's not all. It's not all the sequence on the MRI can have this kind of sensitivities. We should consult it with our the radiologist to have the more, uh, a more powerful the diagnosed the, the sequence from MRI, and also. For the family, for the multiple lesions, there's a uh, progress in the lesions. And the, this is uh, the patient. We can see in 2009, there's a lesions inside. But four years later, we can see in the occipital the, the area, there's a new one. And so for the multiple the lesions, it, we can, in the, in the follow-up, we can see the more and the more, and even the bigger and the bigger the lesions. And in this, this is a summary about the, the lesions inside of the whole the, the central nervous system. So for the, the lesions in the, uh, about 80% in the cerebral, in the supratentorial, the, the, in the, the, the location. Another 15 is about in the brainstem. And another 5% in the spinal cord. It's the same to the, the volume of the, uh, the, the size of the, uh, the anatomies. And about uh, sporadic, the single one, that is uh, for the, it's just only in the incidental findings. It means about 30% of the patient is very stable, is the no symptoms. And about the multiple, the, for the, the, the multiple lesions, the patient, it's about 40% is a uh, no symptom. It's only in the, in the uh, physical examination or other the, uh, 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 incidental findings for the CT scan or MR scan will induce, indicate the lesions. So if the lesion is small, it's uh, no use to treat. And here there's a summary about the risk for the factor and in the clinic, we often to meet the patient and the families will be very nervous when they have the result from the CT or from the MRI, they have this kind of, of the lesion inside of the brain. But not all of the, the lesions need are the surgery. So based on the, the literature, there's a possible risk of factors here at least. There's a, the someone's uh, in some the female sex, it, it means that the, the ladies, the female, and the younger the age, it's younger than 30 or 40 years. In the paralegional, the edema, or even the larger than 
15 milliliters. And all if the Kamner's malformation accompanied with the developmental venous abnormality, there will be a little bit for the bleedings. But here, I, for my personal experience, I think, and our group, we think the parent, the legional edema and the large, the legion size, the bigger than 15 milliliters, 1.5 centimeters is a risk of factors. And also in our group, we have reviewed some of the, uh, the, the brain stem, the legions, the cases in the young, the patients younger than 18 years. And we have some of the, the the, the result that I have mentioned, if the size, the tumor, the lesion is bigger to, than two centimeters, it have a higher risk for bleeding. And if there's a paralegional edema is severely, so there will be a, the higher the risk for bleeding. So for these kinds, these two risks, for me, I, I recommend for the circle approach, not observation. And this, how a uh, stigmatic drawing they start to show if the legion is uh, sm smaller than, than two centimeters, it seems it's stable. But if bigger than two centimeters, it will be, it will be uh, easily for re bleeding again. So re bleeding is a risk factor for the patient outcomes and also is a paralegional edema. Okay, so I have one to size. One is the two centimeters, but the, now I, I think this, this study is uh, about 10 years ago. Now I, I think it's maybe 1.5 is much more better than two. <laughs> this, um, I, this is my modification for my previous studies. And another, and another uh, uh, situation I want to emphasize is about opinion. Because you know, based on our understanding, we are not so nervous, uh, so concerned about uh, cavernous malformations in brainstem. Because uh, in the past, we even our doctor will be nervous, will be concerned about the situation, about the, there's a brainstem uh, cavernous malformation, we are more pre prone to do the surgery. But now we are more conservative. We have the follow up, we can do the observation. But there's a one exception that is if the cavernous malformation in medulla, even it is a small, it's not 1.5 centimeter, it's not two centimeters in this area. I will recommend the surgery for the patient because in our ex experience and in our the review of the, the data, we found in medulla, there's a legion in my cavernous malformation that is more lethal, that is the more fatal than other place to have the uh, 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 brain uh, arrest. So brain arrest. So for this area, if the cavernous malformation in my dollar, we will, is maybe one point centimeters, we will recommend the surgical intervention, not observation, because there's a, it's very easy to have, to have the heart arrest or even the breath arrest because in our experience, we have this the situation, it, that is a disaster. And this is a one, the case in our group. So this is uh, the legion because it's acute inside of bilateral, the, the leg weakness, the liver, the limb weakness. And we, it's a, they were found there's a bleeding in the medulla, but after two weeks, Two months, uh, four months, it uh, become larger, and uh, the patient to 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 have a more the more severe the, the symptoms, and also to have a uh, the subsequent of the subconsciousness, and even the short of breath, and we do the operation, the patient becomes stable, and even we have uh, the the patient during the observation, the patient died because of the capture small formation in medulla. So now for the, the patient have the medulla uh, capture small formation, we recommend, we recommend the operation. So in our group, 
About 10 years ago, we summarized and published the internal neurosurgery. It's, a, it's a about uh, 300 cases in the brainstem cavernous malformation. We have uh, uh, the we have the, uh, uh, that's the summaries about maybe except the legions in the medulla, we have a more conservative observation, but if the, there's a legion in medullary, we have a recommend more aggressively. And about besides of the, the, the surgery, we have a, another, we have a, other options. The first one is observation. And then is a surgery after that, is radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is a very good uh, options for the brain tumor, even for some kind of the vascular uh, disease. But is it good for the cavernous malformation in brainstem? The first one is a medication. So far, medication is not a good option. It's in the future, maybe very promising. Now come back to the radiotherapy for the brainstem. And this is from our uh, the research in our group about, about the 300 cases in brainstem uh, cavernous malformation. We can see if the patient have the surgery, surgical intervention, there's a very, very stable, there's almost no bleeding again. But if the patient didn't receive the surgery, either he received the observation or gamma knife, we can see this for the observation and the gamma knife is almost the same. It's almost uh, it's, uh, about 9% of the rebleeding. So, so far, we don't recommend gamma knife for the cavernous malformation in brainstem. And also our Japanese, our Japanese colleagues in the radiotherapy, they published very good. They did a very good research in the brainstem and they find a very good indication for the brainstem. Uh, brainstem the cavernous malformation. There's a double 15. It means if the lesions is smaller than 15 milliliters, and also the dose, radiation dose is smaller than 15 gray, it will be safe. Otherwise, we can see there's still the bleeding or edema, the, the fetal edema. So if we recommend refer the patient to, to the radio surgery, we should remind of our, our the, uh, radio therapist to know this indication. Otherwise, for me personally, I don't recommend the patient to receive any kind of radio surgery for the brain stem. And here there's a legion received the gamma knife. We can see the A, that is the fish, this the patient to have a very small, the, the, the cavernous small malformation inside our brain and uh, and he bleeding again and they received the gamma knife but uh, it's a very and uh, he received the gamma knife and then no use and the patient to die and this is uh, for the cyber knife and we know cyber knife is a good is a is a good options for the radiotherapies is very is good is a new the treatment option for the therapies but i think it's not so good for the brainstem uh, cavernous malformation also this is the case in the brainstem uh, to receive the cyber knife and repeating repeating again and this we have to do we do the operation because the first time uh, radiation is not in our hospital, in other hospitals. And also inside, can you see the video? Hello? Yes, 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 yes we can. Yeah. Okay, so in the, we can see this, uh, the, the, our backs. This is the fourth one trick. We can see the legions and, and uh, with uh, our the surgical skills. We can dissect and remove the, the lesion totally. And in this way, the patient have a very good the outcome. We have the, it's a seven weeks after the operation, the, the young, the ladies recovered very well. And so this may be the knife, gamma knife is a very good 
uh, treatment safe, even not so safe for the chimerous malformation in brain stem. So this is our workflow for the treatment of brainstem cavernous. If there are no segment, no significant hemorrhage, we just do observation. If there's a hemorrhage and a very severe symptom, so if it's superficially, we will do the operation. Within two or four weeks, it means timing for the surgery is maybe seven, one week to two, uh, four weeks after the surgery. If, it, if the lesion is deep-seated, we will to choose our the safe entry zoom to find a very good way to receive the to reach the lesion and remove the, the lesions. And here, there's a very good the summary about the brain surgery followed by a spatula. That is a two point two point methods, and another is brain stem entry safe entry zoom. It is uh, because we can have that uh, follow the safe entry zoom to enter the brain stem. Besides of the two point, I want to emphasize on the third is the intraoperative gentle dissections. And the, another is the multi-modalities multi is Im image guided third techniques. And also monitoring is very important. And the fourth is also post-operatively management. And in the papers, in the 16, 2016, there's a very good summaries about uh, the way how to do to approach. And uh, there's a lot from the above to the below. I didn't answer this uh, too much. You can have this uh, in, the, uh, in, in the papers. And then now, besides of, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so and this this beautiful the pictures we can have this from the website from the all the papers. There's a mentioned more than ten safe entry zones for the brain stem from the from the backward from the uh, the mid brain from pons even for the uh, medallas. And also now I want to emphasize nowadays we can use our image guide the more precisely to find the legions to the, the fibers surroundings to give us how to know the legions and the, the fibers surrounding and we how we can find a way to reach the legion to have a low the complications and also all this we need before the operation, we should consult with our the radiologist to have the uh, uh, very they're very good powerful the software to dissect all these kind of fibers inside of the brainstem to give us an eye to, to visualize these fibers and also visualize the, the legions and this is depend our very powerful the uh, uh, radiologist. There's a software to dissect, and we can see these the fibers inside of the of the uh, uh, brainstem of fibers, and we can see the green one is um, the trigeminal nerve, and also this is the middle cerebral cerebellar peduncles, and also the below one that, that is a fissure and and the uh, uh, the, the seven and the eighth the nerves. All this to give us particularly for our young doctors, we should have these uh, digital dissections. I mean, not only in the dissections inside of the, the lab, we have these uh, digital dissections to, to distract this uh, information before the operations. And uh, here there's a legion we did. Oh, sorry. Now I will share my I don't see the video. Yeah. So this is uh, about 47, the, the gentleman. They suffered, there's a legion inside of, of the medulla. 
And his, um, and we can see from the conventional MRI, we can see the lesion in the medullary, and also there's a company with um, the developmental. Well, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, because I'm here, in my side is not stable. So. We have the D DSA to show there's, uh, we can see nothing. It's a versatile. Okay, from the, or the uh, brainstem to what crustacean, we can have the, the fibers. The legions is in green and the fibers in blue. And with the 3D assessors, we can have more precisely, we have the UKF, the method to distract more fibers. We can have the motor fibers and we can have the sensory fibers and also we can have the fibers for the eyes movement. And all these, we can have a very, very good understanding about the legions and the surrounding the, the legions. So in this way, we can know more precisely. And before the operation, we can have a very good surgical plan to preserve is the, the, the fibers, for example, is, is a motor or it's a spinal thalamus fibers or it is the sensory fibers or is medical longitudinal fasciculars. And interoperatively, we choose the safe entry zone. Based on our knowledge, we can have, a, we can know where to go. And, but for this case, we can use the fibers as the tracking and under the, uh, the, the probe, under the navigation, and we can see under the point, there's a much more fibers in this country <clears throat> too. If we move more laterally, there's uh, not so many fibers. More now is a return to the fibers, the less fibers, it's very laterally. So in this way, we use this to reach the lesion. And also we used ultrasound for the uh, collaboration for the brain shifting. And we know brain shift is, uh, is a challenging for the navigation. But to, uh, fortunately, we have the ultrasound. And also we know in brain stem, it's more stable than other place because it's fixed by the fibers. And from the interoperative way, we can see the, the force, the flaw of the force of ventricle. And this is, uh, we open the brainstem and we reach the legion and we remove it uh, in piecemeal, piece by piece and very gently to remove the legions and uh, to keep the, the surroundings in, intact. And also, you know, in this, we can have the more, uh, the complication, the, uh, the less complication than the, than the conventional way to remove this. So after the image guide, we return to our very conventional way. And after a section, we use our the, uh, ultrasound for the scan. And also we use intraoperative MRI to see whether there's a residue of the legions. So we return to this uh, to surgical again and reach it uh, because it's a uh, very high. Now we to remove it, the residue of the, the legions in this way. So we use the image guide, the third uh, techniques for our to remove the, the residue of the legions. Because you know, in, in, the, in the brainstem, in medullary, the the regions, we should be very, very, very gentle to reduce uh, the post-operative complications. And then we can even, we can return to the fourth ventricle. And under the monitoring, we can have a more process to remove the, the legions from this side. Very, very small, uh, bipolar, to remove the, the legions. And sometimes we should know how, when to stop, because we know there's a still very, very big, the vessels. We cannot remove the big, the vessels. 
and after the operation, the patient move freely and have some the uh, the weakness of the sens sensory, but the fibers were precisely is good. And also, this is the after operation we can repeat the image, the, the, the scan to have this this is uh, is not uh, based on our the examination. It's based on the image, the the test. And uh, thirty days after the patient moved, uh, lived the very independent life, it is returned removed to the almost to normal life. But for his because uh, he have uh, some the depolar because the movement is not so, so it's have a new challenge for us. Um, okay, so I'm almost uh, finished my topic and uh, thank you for having me and uh, thank you. I'm uh, more than happy to have uh, some discussions. <laughs> my, my slide some problems. Sorry for that. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jie. Uh, we really enjoyed your uh, and learned a lot from your presentation. Um, personally, uh, I was uh, very much impressed uh, by your last you know, surgical video. You know, uh, if I were you, I will probably access the, uh, approach the lesion from the, just only from our uh, fourth ventricle. And that might cause some uh, disruption of the fiber, but you beautifully preserve the uh, fibers, uh, which was shown in the post-operative MRI. And uh, you created the two you know, pathways to approach the lesion. Well, it, it was a uh, very nice uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, uh, we have two uh, discussants for you. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, whether uh, Professor uh, Pirzat here. Yes. Do we have Professor Pirzat? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, first, uh, I'd like to have a comment from uh, uh, Professor Bosniak. Uh, thank you. Is okay. Can you can you hear me? It's okay. Uh, yes, very clear. Hello, everybody. Again, uh, Professor Tangji, thank you very much for a great presentation. I'm really impressed, first of all, by equipment of your OR. It's great. It's a top, top equipment and uh, very good surgical technique. And uh, so I'm impressed, really. Thank you very much. Uh, you didn't uh, say anything about the um, choosing the, the place of... Uh, maximal abuting of the cavernoma to the surface of, uh, of the, uh, the brainstem. So uh, what is it? it's, my, it's my question. Well, if you can uh, find the safe entry zone, but the place of abuting of the cavernoma is located a little bit aside, what would you do? Which, which side would you, would you uh, choose for entering the brainstem? Uh, thank you. Thank you for your questions. That uh, you know, uh, the principle we know that we have the safe entry zone. And um, this is uh, based on our the knowledge uh, anatomy in the in the uh, normal in yes. the normal anatomy. There's the no lesion. So in the if there's a lesion, so there's uh, fibers may be pushed yes. in the, to the to the to, to, to somewhere we do we, we don't know maybe the farm maybe anterior maybe the posterior maybe the medial maybe lateral so see if entry zone is good it's very good and also based on our the research and even we have this uh, very good uh, the fiber striking the technology mm -hmm. we still almost follow the the safe entry zone the principle but we have some modification. It means if if the safe entry zone is uh, because of the, there's the fibers because of it mm -hmm. pushed by the by the legions, it's just underneath 
the mm -hmm. impact zone. We right. may change a little bit. A little bit change, a little more. Yes. So you are flexible. You are flexible during surgery. This yeah, is, yeah. That's yeah. That the point. That the point. I wanted to hear it from you. Yeah. yeah. Thank a combination. You very much. Thank it's you. a combination about the safe entry zone and also yeah. the fiber yeah. strike. We know yes. the fiber striking sometimes is not so reliable. I mean, we need. We still need even the uh, the monitoring. The monitoring. Yeah. Fine. Yes. yes. Right. So amazing. thank you again. Thank you. I have some uh, comments maybe for our younger neurosurgeon. So let me let me uh, uh, speak about it. Okay, that's fine. Can I yes. can I comment yes. a little bit? Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. The first comment. first of all, I, I'd like to speak about classification, classification of um, brain and carcinoma. In my practice, I extend the the brain stain the uh, strategy for brain stem carcinomas to the all midline carcinomas from optic nerve. Uh, to the to the medulla oblongata. So for me, it's midline carcinoma, carcinoma of the chiasm of thalamus, hypothalamus, brain, any brainstem. I have the same tactics, not only brainstem, but all the all the midline carcinomas for me is like a uh, same group. And from the other hand, the cerebellar uh, hemispheric uh, carcinomas. It is almost the same as supra cerebral, uh, supra cer uh, supra tentorial uh, hemisphere. So, uh, what it's my classification. Uh, it's not published, but uh, I, in my clinical practice, I use uh, this uh, separation of groups of patients. So, because the uh, because the hemispheric uh, cerebellar uh, cavernomas are not so dangerous as uh, brainstem cavernomas. That's first. And uh, then I'd like to say about um, timing of surgery, about strategy uh, to, for patients with um, bleeding from carcinoma. First of all, of course, we usually start from conservative treatment for from conservative management, and we observe the patient. Uh, according to uh, recommendation, we almost never operate on the patient with the first bleeding to the brainstem. Uh, as everybody, uh, but if patient deteriorates, we should the patient should be operated on. Uh, here is the question of timing: when to operate? Of course, it's better to wait uh, at least seven, uh, fourteen days to 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 have the liquid liquid blood to remove it. it the removal could be easy, but at the same time, with the, during this observation, we can uh, get another bleeding. I had it in practice, so uh, this tactics is very individual. Also, uh, concerning the second bleeding, second bleeding is not the direct indication for surgery. If the cavernoma is still deep seated, if the hematoma is not so big, and the approach could be uh, quite traumatic to this lesion, uh, we prefer to, to prefer the conservative way. And if you remember the publication by Professor Bozinov. I suppose it was 2020. Uh, he showed then if we uh, make a good selection between uh, between uh, conservative and surgical treatment, we have almost the same results among non-operated and among operated. So it means that nowadays, in majority of clinics, we perform the well selection, a good selection of the patients uh, between uh, active and and uh, not surgical strategy. It's very it's also important. So. Once again, want to say that the um, tactics for the management for uh, brainstem carcinomas are very, very individual. And a few words about surgery, how we do it, because I have not uh, uh, ultrasound integrated with the neural navigation. I have just navigation. I have not intraoperative MRI also. So unfortunately, but I can. I can. I have a good neurophysiologist. Uh, in my OR, I have navigation and uh, and uh, I have a uh, my microscope. So what we do? So step by step, we perform approach. Then we evaluate the surface of the brainstem, trying to find the entry zones, possible entry zones. Not always it's easy. And then we start with neurophysiology. Then we, we stimulate the brainstem and find the nuclei of the um, cranial nerves. You know, this uh, classical publication by Bertolanffy, where he shows that uh, the location of nuclei is very, very variable. 
very individual. So in every case, we make like a mapping of the, for example, forced, uh, forced ventricle. And only after there, we, we find the so-called entry zones. And um, what is also important to go on uh, the stimulation during su surgery when you are inside uh, of the brainstem, not from, only from the surface. Once we remove the cavernoma and go to along the capsule of the hematoma, we go on the stimulating around around the, to to be aware of where the nuclei and pathways are located. So what we do in practical in, in our in our practice, and a few words about venous malformations. In majority of patients with the cavernoma, we have a venous anomaly site usually one big vein or uh, so I prefer not to touch and no one recommends to touch these big veins. It's better to, to leave them uh, aside, not to have the venous uh, infarction in the brainstem during surgery. So that is my comment and thank you very much. I hope it will be profitable for our younger colleagues. And thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Pazniak, for sharing your you know, thoughtful you know, knowledge and uh, experiences. Uh, I see uh, Ben raising his hand. Uh, uh, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Yes, and uh, thank you, Chairman, and also uh, and thank you, Professor, and for your great lecture. I would like to congratulate on your uh, excellent surgeries on the uh, carcinoma. So uh, it's, uh, the lecture is quite useful to young neurosurgeon on the approach and how, how we can um, uh, prepare well preoperatively on uh, carbonoma surgery. I would like to ask uh, Professor um, about the timing of the surgery. Uh, when would you perform the MRI after the onset of the timing to get a precise uh, DTI data? And how long would you wait for the, uh, uh, for the, how long would you wait to perform the surgery after the onset of the bleeding? Uh, usually uh, how many weeks or how many months you would, uh, would, uh, would you wait uh, for surgery? My second question is about the uh, intraoperative monitoring. So uh, 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 how would you uh, monitor um, uh, intraoperative monitoring during the surgery? And would you try to map uh, do some mapping uh, during the surgery to get the exact site of the uh, entry zone. Thank you so much. Me? Or for yes, other? Uh, uh, he made a question yes. to you. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So, my, my, I mean, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Very good questions for the for the timing. So, but, but firstly, I think is also I talk about the, the indication for surgery. Firstly, I want to say if the lesion is bigger than 1.5 centimeters, that is uh, more precise for, for the re-bleeding. For this kind of the lesion, I recommend the surgical intervention. Otherwise, if the lesions, except for the medullary, if the lesion is almost one centimeter, is only the first bleeding and the last one centimeter, so I just a conservative observation. Is no need for the oper operation at all. Okay. So if the lesion is big than one point five centimeters, and if the, the lesion surrounding have a very severe the edema for this kind of the lesion, we I will recommend for the surgery, and for this. I will do, do the DTI for the for the fibers, and we know because you know that uh, the bleeding and the, the, the DTI this technology is very sensitive to the bleeding. So it means it will have some the distractions and a bit distortion about the fiber striking. So this for the conventional con conventional the uh, DTI of the of striking is uh, not so reliable. We we may you use other UKF. Uh, other hardy, uh, other kind of the fiber striking technology is not conventional. We cannot have that in the brainstem or the medtronic. This kind of commercial software is no use. And we maybe use the some 3D slicers. Okay. And also for the uh, for the for the for for the timing for the surgery, normally I recommend maybe two weeks, two weeks after the surgery, uh, after bleeding. 
after the simple term. So it means it is stable for the, 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 the tissue surrounding the lesions. It's more uh, for easy, for the intraoperative man, man, manipulator. And otherwise, if the, it's, uh, it's too early, it uh, will have uh, uh, the, the, the injury because of our the infections in property. And also for the monitoring, for the based on the if entry zoom, this knowledge and also the fiber tracking, the information, we can have uh, surgical uh, plans. And also intraoperatively, we can use of the monitoring to localize the fibers. Where is where? Where is the fiber is more? Is a more um, safe and the, um, the less the injuries. So this is a combination about the knowledge, about the information all together to have to do the operation. It's not only based on one step. So hopefully, I think this is this is my uh, the workflow for, for my uh, for my the, uh, the treatment for the patient. It, okay. Yes. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Session. Thank you very much. Uh, I think your, you know, the indication or how to determine uh, when to surgery is very clear and understandable to us. Uh, I, I know, uh, you know, the uh, Dr. Uh, Karimov is raising his hand, but I will uh, give you a chance to, uh, you know, uh, make a question or comment. But uh, before you, uh, let me have a uh, comment from uh, Professor Prizert from Afghanistan. Yes. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And I'd like to say thank you for uh, inviting me this webinar and uh, uh, Konnichiwa. And I'd like to say Ni hao to <laughs> Professor Tangji. Uh, thank you very much. It was excellent presentation, especially uh, for us and also for young neurosurgeons. It was uh, good and it, uh, we are looking for the learning purpose and it was uh, especially uh, uh, good uh, tailored and for and uh, good objective for uh, uh, learners. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say congratulations for your uh, nice presentation. But uh, I'd like to know that your advice for uh, in situation uh, for low income countries like Afghanistan and other countries that we haven't uh, gone on knife and uh, uh, near navigation and uh, other possibilities for the, to do surgery or radiotherapy. What's your advice uh, for uh, helping the, this kind of patients like uh, the Kavarnoma and the uh, Brain stem and uh, uh, my, uh, surgery for uh, malformation. Uh, it's but limited resource. I like to, your advice. We we are doing uh, conservatively, but uh, like uh, also to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Pradat, Doctor Pradat. It's a, it's a hello. <laughs> it, it, it's nice hello. to, to see, uh, see the colleagues from Afghanistan. And as you know, my brother, my, my, my older brother, my older brother once worked in Afghanistan for four years. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I'm five, uh, and uh, he brought a lot of the gift from the Afghanistan. <laughs> oh, okay. and, and, and you know, uh, for your questions, I, I think if we don't have this kind of uh, uh, very expensive uh, facilities such as the navigation, intraoperative MRI, that, uh, that's no problem. That is no problem because for my personal, I grew up, I learned from the, as a, in the area, uh, all the experience is the, without this uh, navigation or the intraoperative MRI. So we can still have a very safe and a very satisfied operation. And all this is based on our knowledge about anatomy. Anatomy, uh, anatomy, and anatomy is very, very important. This is uh, the principle we should follow. And uh, the anatomy, the safe entry zoom, and the two point method is uh, very, very, very important. The experience for the oldest uh, doctors we should follow. 
uh, even without this expensive. And we should know where is uh, the safe. So without that, I, I think we can have almost, almost 90% of the precise to do the operation. If we have other these facilities, maybe it can increase uh, a little bit, maybe from the 90 to 95%. So let's no experience facility is not um, is not the uh, contradictions we cannot do, do the operation and I encourage you and your college to do the operation to treat, treat the cameras in brainstem and from our experience and other colleague experience the surgical intervention is the best way to for the patient to have the cavernous malformation in brainstem. So observation is not so good as the surgical intervention. But I want to emphasize is the anesthetist. Anesthetist and also post-operative management is also important, particularly for the keep the airway, to keep the airway, the patent, the very good, very, very important for the outcome for the patient. So no, a expensive facilities is no problem. And I, I'm sure you can do it very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ji Ji Wu Yong Xie. Wu Yong Xie. In Chinese. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, 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 for your advice, but uh, uh, if you accept, uh, we, uh, if it's possible, we send some of our young colleagues for uh, training. Uh, no problem, no problem. It's uh, it's uh, your 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 any young doctors are welcome to to Beijing, and so okay. pl please please, and we will take care good of them, good care of them. Okay, okay. no problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Pizet. And uh, okay, uh, let's uh, go ahead and have uh, comments or questions from Dr. Karimov. Uh, you you have to uh, you know terminate your mute. Uh, you are unmute. Excuse us. Uh, can you hear me okay. clearly now? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh... I want to uh, thank, uh, thank Professor Ji Tsang that he is performing uh, very great uh, lectures for us, especially for uh, young neurosurgeons like we are now. Uh, and uh, it was a really excellent uh, lecture. And I wanted to ask one question about the uh, cover malformations malformations uh, in the ponds. Uh, and I want to ask uh, what kind of uh, uh, surgical approach do you use uh, or uh, have you been using in your experience for the cavernomous malformations in the ponds, uh, uh, particularly? Okay, thank, thank you for questions. For the cavernous in ponds, is, um, I think for the surgical approach, that is quite variant. We can do it from the, from the posterior, that's the conventional one, from posterior. But we have a concern that will be injury to the facial nerve. That once was very common, the conventional, but now we pro it from the lateral, not from the posterior, from the lateral. One is to, to, to trans the cerebellar peduncle. Another is the retrosigmoid approach. Retrosigmoid approach. That is uh, before, uh, between the uh, uh, seven and the fifth. This, this is the safe entry zone, this is the approach. And if the bleeding is a little bit superior part, we will use subtemporal approach from also from the lateral leg, from the also from the trigeminal, this uh, approach, the paris, trigeminal, the sulcus to enter the, the pons. So now nowadays we prefer to use the lateral leg approach instead of the posterior approach. And then now we know even some of the colleagues are very aggressive. They use the anterior approach. They, it means they use the uh, endonasal, endo, the trans, uh, the clivers approach to do the, the approach, uh, to do the lesion inside of the pump post anteriorly. But for me, I, I, I don't do that. I, I use the, nowadays I use the post laterally, laterally, subtemporal 
or use the retrosigmoid approach. Okay, that is uh, for the points. Okay. Thank you for our answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions from the uh, participants? It's good. Uh, okay, thank uh, you. Uh, Sui Chuoya, okay, we have, go ahead. Yeah. We have two other uh, senior panelists, uh, Dr. Ashish Kumar uh, and okay. Dr. Sneha Chitra. We will take a mm -hmm. comment from them. Uh, Dr. Ashish Kumar, can you please uh, give your comment about Professor Tangji's uh, presentation and your uh, uh, thoughts for the cavernous malformation in the brainstem? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sachin. Uh, Professor Tangjoy, that was an excellent uh, lecture. Um, I don't have anything to add, but just wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, the extradural approach. I I, um, I was teaching a few days back about, uh, you know, the Kawase's approach for uh, the upper pons uh, lesions. So uh, I know you said about the subtemporal approach for the upper lesions, who, which are coming to the uh, to the ependymal surface laterally. So uh, how frequently you actually employ the skull base approach? Um, I mean, they are very rare in that location, but in case if that is the situation, do you prefer subtemporal versus extradural uh, approach or what's your preference? Okay, thank you. Some of your questions. And for the lateral approach to the pons or the, to the clivers, the, the regions, uh, nowadays I, I followed the, the it's a Kawasi's professor's approach because I learned this and uh, the subtemporal ex uh, extent approach from the th Professor Kawasi's approach. Initially, I, 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 I used the epidural approach, but uh, nowadays, when I had the knowledge about the anatomy and the maneuvers, uh, nowadays I didn't use the epidural approach almost anymore. I just used the subtemporal approach, subtemporal, subtemporal approach to do this, to drill the, the uh, pitocial apex. Uh, because, you know, Kawasi triangle, Mm, triangle is a is a is a is a is a, is a, is a open is a is a gate to the to the posterior fossa. To do that uh, epidurally, it's a uh, quite challenging, and also it's not so familiar for the for the neurosurgeons. So now I I get the the the, the concept from the Kawase's approach ep epidurally. Now I use it only in the. Uh, Subdurally, subdurally, I cast the tantorum and I drew off the partially of the uh, petrosal apex, the bone, as as far as much as I needed. It's a no need to do too much of the drawing, and also it's a convenient, it's a easy for the surgeons to know that. But basically, I, I got this is based on the Kawasis approach. Or, you know, and then I used a little bit change because maybe I was a lazy. <laughs> I was a lazy. I want to not. I want to save some time, save some energy. So I want I change it a little bit and to do it subdurally, not epidurally. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Tanji and uh, Dr. Ashish Kumar. Dr. Sneha Chitra is our uh, uh, wife speaker for today, but she's also moderator for today's session. Dr. Sneha, may I have your comments on cavernous malformation uh, in brainstem and Professor Tangji's presentation, please. Thank you very much, Professor. It was amazing to see uh, your wonderful surgery with all the latest adjuncts that help us to achieve safe resection. Uh, my question is based on a recent case that we had. Uh, it is uh, fitting in with the pattern of a familial uh, cavernoma, multiple cavernomas, with a cavernoma also in the brainstem, and not exactly greater than 1.5 centimeter. So in this case, uh, should we offer surgery for him? So do you have a, a cohort of such patients? So what would you do? Sorry, so sorry, I, I did it at, at 1.5. So, so what kind of the patient situation? Sorry, can you repeat? No, the, the patient had multiple cavernomas, Mm -hmm. and also one in the brainstem, which had not bled. Mm -hmm. uh, his problem was seizure, well controlled with anti-epileptics. But the size was like just 1.5, like just at the cutoff. 
So, oh. would you offer a prophylactic surgery or in the familial multiple cavernomas, would it be a safer bet to wait and observe? <laughs> so, how do you Thank convince you. the patient? This is a quite challenging the, uh, the questions. Uh, from personal, uh, I haven't uh, I haven't met such a situation. Have you have mentioned? There's a multiple the lesions. One is in the brainstem is one centimeter, one point five centimeters. But the patient is suffered from the seizures, right? Yes. Okay. So for the seizures, we know it's a seizure. Seizures is not is not caused by the, the cavernous malformation in brainstem. It's from the max, right? Yes. yes. This, we can this uh, indication for surgery to do the for the cortex or for the paralephalic uh, the, the medications. And for the lesion, if, if the lesion inside of the brain stem, it is 1.5 centimeters, but if it's stable, if it's stable, there's a no edema, there's a no symptom for this kind of the lesions. My personally, I think is observed. Firstly, before half year hmm. to repeat. And we know for this kind of the legions, multiple the legions, the legions will increase gradually, slow by slow. So for this kind of the legions, I may choose to treat the legion, uh, the, 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 uh, the seizures first, and then give the patient a half year, maybe one year to follow up. If the lesion inside of the brain stem is enlarged, hmm. bigger, I will do the operation for the brain stem also. Okay. Thank you. So we are observing that patient. Uh, so hopefully in a year we'll see. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you. Maybe I have the right answer, right? <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Very good question. Thank you, thank you very much. I can see one more hand raised by uh, Dr. Kabi Bullo Kasano. Dr. Kasano, can you introduce yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Oh, yes. Hi, uh, I am Dr. Kabi Bullo Kasano from Uzbekistan. So first of all, thank you, Professor. Thank uh, for your excellent presentation experience you have shared it with us. It was good information. It was very good to learn from you and from Dr. Wozniak as well. So uh, I'm currently a fellow of endoscopic neurosurgery at Nagoya University Hospital under uh, Dr. Takeuchi. So here we are doing the uh, endoscopic uh, treatment for different uh, located uh, brainstem cavernomas. So in some times we do a uh, retrosigmoid approach and but uh, before operation, we do some planning uh, using a brain lab. Uh, we study uh, tracts, DTAs, and uh, sometimes we do a uh, transcranial uh, endoscopic surgery via uh, foramen of Monroe for superior seated brainstem uh, cavernomas. So I wanted to ask about uh, this one so because you told us that uh, during surgery after the removal of the cavernoma, you do you perform a check it uh, interoperative MRI. So in our cases, I'm just learning and I'm not expert at all. So uh, we are doing this endoscopy and just a transcylinder approach. So with a different angle of endoscope, we can observe every, uh, every field of surgery and uh, this is uh, with uh, wood field techniques as this continuous high pressure irrigation systems so uh, surgical fields remain clear and uh, we confirm uh, total removal of uh, gross total envelope resection of these cavernomas so i wanted to ask about this one is uh, any experience or practice of use endoscopic treatment of brainstem cavernomas in your country or in a hospital Thank you. Thank you for questions and recommendations and the comments. I, I think endoscope is very, very important tools for all the neurosurgeons, just like the microscope. So for this case, I, I show the case I use the microscope. Actually, we, we nowadays we use the endoscope for some kinds of the 
uh, brain regions, including the brain, uh, the cavernous small formations, and just like we use the microscope. And also, your your word is is right. For for my case, showed in the lectures, if I had if I had used the the endoscope, we may find we may find the just residue of the region because we use the endoscope inside of the the region. And we, we, can, we can have a view of that because the microscope, microscope have the blind the angle, blind area we cannot see. With, with the endoscope, it's a more, uh, we can see more precisely. And then maybe there's a region. So nowadays we use the endoscope for the brain tumor uh, endoscope. That is a, a nose that, that transnasal, transnasal, transesphenoidal. That's another for the uh, acoustic. A vestibular schwannoma, brain tumor inside of a ventricle, many, many uh, places in, inside of the brain. So endoscope is uh, as important as a microscope to, to our the neurosurgeon. I totally agree. And sometimes it can maybe replace, replace uh, our the, uh, uh, the intraoperative MRI because we have a very good view of the lesion left behind so there's a no need for the uh, for the uh, just repeat the check and also we, it can reduce the numbers of the intraoperative scan for the for the check so i think endoscope is very important and nowadays it's very popular and not only in, in my institution and in all over the, the china and we have this kind of the training not only in my uh, institution but also many many places in, in china now so uh, we have also emphasized to our young doctors, you should know both microscope and endoscope. No one, why is not enough? Why not enough? Okay, thank you. Thank you for recommendation and comments. Thank you. Thank you, professor. One more questions. So uh, do you use a uh, forehand techniques or some kind of uh, endoscopic holders because there is a endoscope from Olympus, uh, Japan in the arm. Uh, I was very interested in, in, but it is not available in my country. So is there in your country use some kind of endo endoscope holders or just the forehand techniques? No, uh, one is uh, for the forehand of uh, operation is uh, now is uh, quite common. Now in the big centers in China, not, not, not everywhere. Uh, for the endoscope holders, it's uh, because it's a expensive also. So it's not uh, so popular, so common in, in China now. And it, it's in small, small, small numbers of the big centers, they have the holders, your endoscope holders. And then nowadays we have a uh, invent some the, uh, you know, the robot, robot so neurosurgical robot is can hold the endoscope. And it's another kind of the, the neuro uh, endoscope holders. We use that as a holder <laughs> instead of the Olympus. It's uh, very good, the holders. They have to use other ways to instead of the, uh, the, the big, the expensive near, uh, endoscope holder. We invent other small, small devices to do the, the job, okay? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kasano, for the active participation. An interesting discussion is going on, but I think we'll have to uh, put a small pause because we'll have to let other speakers also speak. So I would request Professor Tangji to please stay with us and also participate uh, uh, in the discussion at the end of uh, Dr. Sneha's talk. And we'll come back to you uh, with more questions. So uh, now next talk is by uh, Dr. Sneha Chitra. Dr. Sneha Chitra is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery, Apollo Hospital, Chennai. And uh, she's also an active member of ACNS YNS committee. So she's going to talk today about uh, role of programmable uh, ventriculoperitoneal shunt system for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Dr. Sneha, please uh, share your screen and you can start your presentation. Sure. Thank you, Sachin. Uh, at the outset, I'm extremely grateful to uh, the YNS committee uh, for uh, this opportunity. And uh, Professor Kato's inspiration is the beginning of everything. And 
for every young neurosurgeon, more so as a female neurosurgeon. Thank you, ma'am, for doing whatever. Uh, and I hope to emulate and follow in your footsteps, however small, you know, I am making those efforts. Thank you. So uh, going to my presentation. So moving from the giant uh, uh, neurosurgical topic of uh, brainstem cavernomas, we have something very simple and uh, something bread, butter, and basic of neurosurgery that every young neurosurgeon will get to do. There's going to be a shunt in your list, uh, you know, every other day. And for a condition that's only increasing uh, these days, normal pressure hydrocephalus. And uh, at the center I work in, we are doing entirely programmable VP shunts. So I'm going to talk about this. So just a few uh, words, the basics that we all know. Uh, since 1965, this condition, NPH, has existed. And we're seeing <coughs> excuse me, more people being diagnosed with this because we are picking up more cases thanks to you know, our improved radiological screening. So every other patient above 60 years with a ventriclomegaly is being referred to us. So it's a very reversible neurological condition, especially the idiopathic cases and the secondary NPH types. These are the two subtypes and both of them are quite shunt responsive if the patient selection is good. Gait disturbance, cognitive impairment, and urinary symptoms. The most common presentation is gait. So very uh, less percentage of people come with your classical triad, but gait disturbance is something that every patient has. It's 100%. The risk factors are diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, and previous history of stroke and heart disease is going to increase their uh, propensity to the microvascular uh, changes, and they are high-risk category for developing NPH. And this is the last line is something very important because these days we are seeing so many patients with associated neurodegenerative disorders, especially Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and other uh, causes of uh, vascular dementia. So what happens is all these patients are not adequately evaluated. They are NPH mimics. So we lose this set of patients. However, they do respond to shunt. So that's going to be the crux of the whole presentation. So what's the pathophysiology? Loss of compliance to CSF flow and circulation. This is a very good image from one of the studies. So this is normal pressure hydrocephalus and this is brain atrophy. So eerily similar, but then when you look closely, the callosal angle is uh, more acute here. It's more acute here. The periventricular lucency are more symmetrical. It is asymmetrical here. And all other classical features, the widening of sylvian fissure, and this is one particular point which half late people have uh, realized to be of uh, surgical significance. So these patients do better when you have a tight convexity. So this is this is a patient who is going to be extremely shunt responsive versus this who is just a patient having atrophic ventricles. He may not respond. But having said that, if his symptoms are presenting with NPH, even this patient is going to uh, benefit with a shunt. So this is a very beautiful scale uh, presented, you know, the INPH radiological scale, in the European Journal of Neurology. So they have developed a 12-point scoring system. The first one is the Evans index greater than 0.3 is significant ventriclomegaly as we all can see. But this, the ones who are in the middle of the spectrum, these are the patients who present with early gait disturbances. They want to move on to this in a year or in uh, two or three years. So these are the patients we have to follow up more closely and will benefit. So narrow sulci in the vertex, as I just mentioned, this finding is something we're going to tell that this patient will benefit. Sylvian fissure is normal versus enlarged. Focally enlarged sulci. Temporal horns more than uh, 4 mm. Callosal angle. Uh, so as the NPH progresses, it's going to become more and more acute. And periventricular hypodensities. This is something it's going to tell you about the interstitial edema. So this periventricular hypodensity and more concentrated in the frontal zone is significant because those are the patients who have uh, typical NPH. The one with PDL all around your entire lateral ventricle is going to fall into the neurodegenerative or the vascular dementia subgroup. So this is uh, oh. an, from another paper where they have uh, grouped into asymptomatic with only radiological indication, possible INPH. These are the ones with the midline scoring with one clinical indicator and one core symptom and the radiology looking like NPH. 
and then probable when the symptoms are worsening. So what are the treatment options? VP shunt is the most commonly performed procedure world over. LP shunts and EPVs are also being done. There are publications, but VP shunt is the gold standard. And coming to VP shunt, we have the fixed valve shunting and the programmable valve shunting. There's more and more evidence emerging and people are shifting to programmable shunt in recent days. So this is uh, a very interesting paper where they have uh, given a good and poor outcome predictor for uh, the people responsive to the uh, you know uh, lumbar trial and those will benefit with shunt surgery, prominent gait disturbance, very mild cognitive impairment, severe cognitive impairment or the patients with severe dementia presenting to us do not do well. So that is a word of caution. We can still do the shunt because their gait may improve, but the cognition will not improve. Abnormal ICP wave pressure, this is something which we do not normally do. We just measure the opening pressure and uh, uh, give a lumbar trial. And absent or moderate white matter disease, this correlates with the extent of cognitive impairment. Now, these are the poor predictors, as I said, extensive cortical atrophy, severe dementia, and presence of cardiovascular disease because they're going to have continuous uh, microisthemic changes and neurodegeneration is going to be progressive. Now, this is a very interesting Japanese study, a very famous one, where they have found disappearance of all the symptoms following surgery and younger age was a predictor of disappearance of gait disturbance. When somebody is in the early 60s, we have to give them the option because they do really well. Now, this paper is stressing on how the objective assessment of gait is to be done before and after three days of controlled CSF drainage and after shunt surgery. So, there are significant changes when you do this before and after your uh, controlled lumbar drainage for 72 hours. This is in contrast with the TAP test, which a lot of people do, where 30 to 40 ml of bolus of CSF is uh, withdrawn and then you look for the improvement immediately. That may not work in the subset of patients who have complex MPH, the ones with Parkinson's, dementia, vascular dementia, and neurodegenerative patients. They may fail the TAP test, but when you go for a 48 hours or a 72 hours controlled drainage, you'll be surprised to see that they will do so well, the gait will improve, and they are candidates for shunt surgery. So this is very important. Again, uh, these complex NPH cases, which are the uh, you know ones which are ignored or less shunted because you no, know, we say Parkinson's is a progressive disease, Alzheimer's is progressive, we can't do anything much. No, these patients also benefit. Although only 8% showed global improvement of the trial, all complex NPH patients improved in gait. And this gait improvement can make so much in, uh, improvement in their uh, physical quality of life. It is very important in the elderly. You make them mobile, the entire quality of life changes. So even these patients with complex NPH, they require a trial. Having said that, VP shunt has its own complications, and this is where the programmable shunts are, you know, having a slighter edge. Infection, we have programmable uh, shunts which are uh, coming with antibiotic impregnation. Even otherwise, what we do is we apply some vancomycin powder over the, you know, programmer area. Shunt malfunction, subdural hygroma and hematoma. Now, this can happen with any shunt, irrespective of programmable or non-programmable. But when it's a programmable shunt, you can be rest assured this shunt malfunction and hygroma and hematomas can be tackled without the need for second surgery. This is perhaps the most important advantage and indication for a programmable shunting, especially in the elderly. And all these uh, patients are most likely on dual antiplatelets for either the heart disease or the stroke, making any surgical intervention potentially risky. Even in a hematoma, a bar hole, or a mini craniotomy, because of the uh, antiplatelet uh, consumption, can end up little messy. So programmable shunt is definitely yes for the elderly and to avoid these complications. Only problem is going to be the cost. The initial cost is expensive, yes. May not be widely available. And uh, we'll have more hospital visits for the programming checks. But then we're avoiding a potential resurgery. So this is uh, the experience uh, in my center here. We are doing only programmable shunts. So in the past one and a half year till date, there have been 24 patients. Everybody is about 60 years. We had an 88-year-old Parkinson patient who did really well. 
50% had Parkinson's disease. They had quite advanced disease when they came to us. All patients had diabetes and hypertension. 12% had stroke and uh, coronary artery disease. And this population was already on antiplatelets. And majority of the patients with DM and hypertension with PIA symptoms are on prophylactic antiplatelets. All patients had gait disturbance. So 100% presentation was walking difficulty, unsteadiness, uh, turning difficulty. So gait disturbance of all stages early to severe. We had one patient who was bed bound and he could start walking with support uh, following the shunt surgery. Five patients had the classical triad. So do not always go for all three symptoms. Only gait disturbance has to be picked up and evaluated. So five people had gait and urinary complaints. Urinary complaints, uh, this is also falling into a tricky territory because most of the males over 60 years have uh, BPH, the prostatic uh, bladder. So urinary complaints may not be entirely attributed to the NPH. So the protocol here is the uh, pre-op evaluation with the MRI brain, including a CSF flow study, uh, the uh, cognitive impairment assessment with the basic MMSC. And what we concentrate on is the gait, because that is the most important factor that's going to determine whether we're going to shunt this person or not, and whether this patient is going to have some benefit with the shunt. So we do a video recording before and after the lumbar drainage. And the protocol in my center is lumbar drainage for 70, uh, 48 hours. And we have had some patients go on to 72 hours. At 48 hours, we stop it. And we ensure drainage of 150 ml minimum in 24 hours. It's, it's a very regulated drainage at 4 to 6 drops per minute. And uh, we do a video recording after the removal of the lumbar drain. And it is both subjectively and objectively compared. And we have had every patient telling that they themselves could see the improvement. And there's a video recording, you know, which we can go through. And uh, even, you know, the distance that they've covered, the time taken to turn, every factor can be assessed. We have a detailed gait assessment with video. And when we do the uh, case of tapping, the opening pressure is also documented. It is usually normal or raised. The mild increase in... Uh, uh, opening pressure can be accepted and this is more often in the secondary NPH cases, not in the idiopathic NPH case. Now, all the patients underwent the standard right uh, Keens point. We use the uh, parietal Keens point for the tapping, programmable VP shunt and uh, we use the Codman uh, programmable shunting and the initial pressure was always at 120. And with this 120, we discharge them. And we follow them up with a CT at one month. And after one month, we see how the gait has improved. And if not satisfactory, the pressure is further reduced. So we go down in steps of 10. So from 120, it's 110 and 100 and 90. So between this 90 and 120, most of the patients had significant improvement in the gait. We also follow them up at six months and one year with CT or MRI. So we had gait improvement in 100% of patients. So the dreaded complication of subdural, we also had, it was two patients, but then one could be managed conservatively. You just increase the pressure, this 120, we have increased to up to 170 in a patient. And uh, you wait and watch if they're asymptomatic, it regresses on its own over four to six weeks. And one patient who was on dual antiplatelets had to be taken up for surgery because he also had a fall. No infection. We do not use any antibiotic impregnated shunt, although now, the same system has antibiotic coated shunts, uh, which are available. We just apply some vancomycin powder over the programmer uh, zone area at the time of closure. And we've had uh, no case with shunt malfunction where we had to go and remove the shunt, no hardware related issues. And this programming is a very non-invasive OP procedure. And we do a check x-ray, not for every patient, but only as a OPD follow-up. Check x-ray of the skull to make sure the Programming is correct. Uh, I would like to present the radiology of a few patients. This was a 66-year-old male with gait and cognitive impairment. So we can see the classical findings. And also I want to say that not every patient will have the every score on radiology, the every uh, point that we discussed. So we'll have to take radiology with a pinch of salt and correlate it with the clinical presentation. Here we can see a prominent PVL, large ventricles, and some asymmetry in the frontal as well. So this is certainly an atrophic brain, but this patient is symptomatic. So this ventriculomegaly deserves a trial lumbar drainage. This patient was shunted and he did really well. 
this was actually a post-op MRI at three months. You can see the shunt tube in situ. The radiology uh, changes are picked up only after six months or one year, but the clinical benefits are seen at the end of one month itself. This is another patient who was already Parkinson, quite uh, advanced Parkinson, who presented with significant gait disturbances and urinary symptoms, uh, worsening, I would say, over six months. Because Parkinson usually gradually worsens. When these patients worsen quickly, then they are candidates which are uh, fitting in with the complex NPH. Again, we can see the uh, prominent in the frontal zone alone. The PVL is more concentrated in the frontal horn. These are the patients who are very shunt responsive. So this is a 61-year-old patient, obese, morbidly obese, with gait impairment. And his ventricle was not uh, very typical of NPH, but we did the lumbar uh, drainage trial for him. And he had remarkable improvement. This is the post shunting at three months. And till date, he's doing fine. His gait has significantly improved. So when in doubt, always give them a trial of lumbar drainage. A continuous drainage is better than a bolus CSF tapping of 30-40 ml. Because 30-40 ml is too less to decide that you know, this patient may or may not uh, need a shunt. So this is a 67-year-old female. with uh, She had everything and also Parkinson. So this was her MRA. It is not very typical, I would say, but she had a successful trial LD following which she was shunted and she's doing very well. So this was a 70-year-old man, very classic uh, NPH MRI. He had gait and urinary complaints and you can see this uh, post-op uh, shunt in situ. You can already see the frontal horns regressing. Uh, there is some uh, uh, brain sinking also, but this patient has to be closely followed up and after this MRI, we increase this pressure by 10. Because these are candidates whom we like to follow once in three months. This programming can be done. A mild change of plus 10 or minus 10 is going to uh, reduce the chances of development of hygroma or subdural in the future. This is a 70-year-old male, uh, severe advanced PD with severe gait disturbance. So again, you could see prominence more in the frontal. And this is a post shunting at three months. He is also doing really well. And all these patients, they continue uh, to remain on their Parkinson medications. What we are doing by shunting is only improving their gait. And that is going to translate into better quality of life. Now, this patient also, you can see there is some hygroma developing. So after this CT, the pressure was increased by 10. So this is uh, the complication I was mentioning. This was one patient who started developing bilateral hygromas, completely asymptomatic. His gait had improved. This was only a radiological finding. So after this, we promptly increased his pressure and he's doing fine. We didn't have to go and intervene. So this was the patient we had to intervene on one side. This is actually a post-op scan. He was on dual antiplatelets. He had a fall. And this is the only patient we had to operate for a subdural following a programmable shunt, which could have been avoided had the patient come to us a little early. So uh, in summary... NPH is a very widely overdiagnosed condition. Every patient over 60 years is going to have ventriculomegaly. But if they are symptomatic, especially with early gait imbalance, they deserve a trial. It's under-evaluated. That is what I would like to emphasize. And if the patient selection is good, uh, we are going to have a great improvement in the overall quality of life. Continuous lumbar drainage for 48 hours, so that is what I am doing for the patients here, is going to pick a better patients for the shunt and especially the complex NPH patients, patients with Parkinson's, dementia. And if they have a successful trial at the end of 48 hours, then they definitely do well after a shunt. Programmable VP shunts, although with initial high cost when you compare with the fixed pressure shunts, they have a, a very good long-term outcome. So I just mentioned how a little change in programming can avoid any uh, surgical intervention. So with this slide, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Sneha. Uh, Dr. Soichi Oya, uh, may I request your uh, uh, 
comments on uh, Dr. Sneha's uh, uh, presentation and uh, uh, your uh, uh, points for uh, management of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I agree with you on that. The you know we should uh, strictly determine the indication of our, uh, this uh, VP shunt. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause to uh, decrease the chance of you know the complication and unnecessary treatment, and uh, uh, in Japan, um, I think the uh, the most you know frequently uh, we are doing our um, tap test instead of the continuous uh, CSF drainage, and uh, we uh, use the uh, up and go test. And also, uh, we uh, you know take the uh, mini mental state examination uh, to see uh, whether the patients have the uh, improvement of their you know uh, orientation. Uh, that we uh, do the uh, interrupted uh, CSF tap like uh, forty or fifty milliliter per day for continuously uh, consecutively for three days. And uh, I have a little experience in uh, continuous um, um, and the CSF, uh, I mean the lumbar drainage to uh, select the patients. Uh, do you see, uh, if you have a uh, um, experience in both you know, procedures, uh, do you see any difference between yes. the, uh, uh, this, you know, the uh, tap test and the continuous CSF brain, uh, drainage? Yes, uh, that's exactly the point I was also skeptical about because my earlier experience was the tap test, 30 to 40 ml. Uh, but with the continuous lumbar drainage, I'm realizing that uh, a lot of patients do better uh, when you uh, take 150 ml per day. And especially, I mentioned the subset of patients, Parkinson and the complex NPH, because a classical NPH patient will uh, is more likely to become positive with a tap test. A patient with Parkinson and not really fitting into the classic NPH, is going to uh, show a positive test at the end of drainage. So this is mm -hmm. something I can vouch for because we had two patients who failed a tap test elsewhere and they were referred to us. And they improved after this 48 hours and they improved after shunt. So these are the patients we may miss if we just do a tap test and tell them you are not fit for shunt. So I, I think it's uh, worth giving this a trial, especially when there is a doubt. When in doubt, go for the continuous uh, lumbar drainage is what I can say. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Toichi Oya. Uh, may I request a comment from uh, Professor Alexander Osniak? Uh, what is your, and he's always very uh, comments, his comments for young neurosurgeons are very, very important. So please, uh, Professor, you. your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Dr. Sneha? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation I and mean, my congratulations. It's a really good job, really good, really good, very clear. Everything is clear, very accurate job. And uh, so congratulate you once more. Uh, so I have a question. So please, uh, how many patients with the uh, signs of uh, Parkinsonism improved the uh, after uh, shunting in your cohort, maybe I missed it. How many uh, patients you really could- 50%, could, uh, uh, 50 person, the entire group was 24. So we had 12 patients with uh, moderate uh, Parkinson disease presenting with yes. uh, symptoms. So 50% of patients, 12. 50%, about half of them. Yes, yeah, 12 okay, thank you very much. And another question also, maybe I missed. In how many patients uh, uh, did you, um, reprogram uh, the shunt uh, in the patient and for how many times did you reprogram uh, the well yeah. yeah that that is a question which is uh, uh, the answer is going to be the follow up ct at the end of one month is going to tell us and also the clinical condition of the patient at the end of one month if the patient is telling okay i'm okay but not significant gait improvement and also on assessment we reduce the pressure by 10 we always reduce it by 10 and not more because anything more is going to increase the chance of a subdural hygroma. So the pressure changes are always made in one step and you mm -hmm. don't go over 10 in one sitting and we repeat the scan at the end of one month or two months. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the radiology and the patient condition. 
So I would say fairly most of the patients required a programming change from 120 to a minimum of 90. So that means four, four times and not every patient required it four times. At so, least. Yeah. So we have gone down to a minimum of 90. But there are patients who have done quite well at just 100 or 110. And we've mm -hmm. had patients who are doing excellent with just 120 itself. So that is very patient specific and depends on the radiology. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, so once more, congratulate. Uh, I cannot add anything more. And uh, also, I, I liked your, um, uh, your statement that uh, the presence of uh, concomitant uh, diseases like uh, some, some degenerative diseases should not stop us in our activity because even in this patient, uh, shunting in this patient is also may help them to, to improve the symptoms. So, so thank you again. Great, great job. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander. Uh, Professor Pawad, is that uh, maybe you can uh, give some comments uh, about normal pressure hydrocephalus management. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Seha Chitra, Professor. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Congratulations. It was uh, well organized. And uh, uh, also, I saw your results was very good. Uh, but, you know, as I uh, previously mentioned, in the low and middle income countries with limited resources, we only use the uh, mid-pressure BP shunts in Afghanistan. And it's available in market, but it's not uh, the programmable shunt are not available in uh, market. And it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's expensive in the market, but it's not available in Afghanistan as well. But we must use mid-pressure uh, shunt. And as you mentioned, we use the uh, events index and with the uh, clinically symptoms of uh, Hakim's period and uh, uh, with lumbar drainage and also putting the uh, mid pressure uh, shunt. Uh, we saw that the clinically uh, our patients are improved. Uh, but I like to know your uh, opinion about the lumbar peritoneal shunt. Is it uh, useful for uh, INPH? And uh, also, uh, when you face the infection, uh, a complicated uh, shunt, uh, what, what's your opinion for uh, maintaining the shunt or removing? And what's the next uh, advice uh, for next step? Your advice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Perizad. Uh, uh, thankfully, in this uh, case series with programmable shunts, uh, we are yet to see an infection, and I hope it remains the same. But uh, I do have experience with the fixed pressure. We have used uh, medium pressure uh, shunts before. And uh, when there's infection, it, it is very difficult to manage, and the only advice is going to be remove it. So And uh, give them a 6 to 12 weeks of uh, break before you go for the shunt, preferably on the opposite side. So that we have done uh, previously when we used uh, fixed pressure shunt. So, but this subset of patient per se, an NPH patient to get a shunt infection is quite rare. Uh, so the shunt infections are uh, less in this cohort. And when we do get it, unfortunately, then we have to remove it. And, and also I would like to add that shunt infections in the elderly over uh, 60, 70 years is not going to be a classical shunt infection. They're going to uh, present with uh, very, very subtle signs of fatigue. They may not have a fever also. They'll have very subclinical symptoms. So to suspect the shunt infection in the elderly is, is one thing, and also to prove it is another one. And when it's proven, when the culture is positive, we always go and remove it. Okay, and what about the uh, lumboperitoneal shunt? Sorry? Uh, lumboperitoneal shunt. Lumboperitoneal shunt, um, um, sorry, I don't have any experience of LP shunting for NPH. We always do it for IIH, for mm. uh, uh, idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension, the benign ICP. We only do LP shunts, but for NPH, I'm yet to do a LP shunt. Okay. And uh, excuse me, uh, do you measure the ICP uh, 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 during the lumbar puncture and also when you do craniotomy, uh, are you measuring the 
Yes, yes. Uh, I did mention that the opening pressure is measured when we do the tap, when we are putting, inserting the uh, uh, lumbar drainage catheter. At that moment, it is measured, it is documented, and only then it is connected to the drainage. So we have seen okay. it to be normal to mildly increased. So just because it is increased, it doesn't mean it is not NPH. And also yes. a lot of patients will have fluctuant uh, uh, changes in the pressure. Uh, actually, scientifically, we're supposed to do an ambulatory lumbar drainage pressure uh, measurement. So it has been proven that the ICP varies and they do have uh, increased pressure in uh, various periods of the day. We don't do that, but we do just one opening pressure at the time of tapping. And also that is going to tell us uh, regarding the pressure that we are going to fix for the programmable valve. Suppose the opening pressure was very high for a particular patient with a secondary NPH following a trauma or a subarachnoid hemorrhage, we would go with a initial pressure setting of 100 or 110 itself instead of 120. So it is going to indirectly tell us what pressure that we can set. We have done that in a few cases. When the opening pressure was high, the titration begins uh, much early. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pawar uh, Professor Tangji, are you there? Yes, yes. Yes, Professor, yeah. may, may I request your comment on uh, Professor Sneha Chitra's presentation and your thought on the management of normal pressure hydrocephalus? What is the practice being followed at uh, your institute? So, you, um, you mean MPH? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, this, this is uh, quite uh, more and more the common in, in older patients and also caused uh, uh, our attention for our the uh, neurosurgeons. We should, but, but I'm not. Uh, I didn't do the the lumbar uh, peritoneal the shunt. So compare VP and LP, which is better for the MPH. This is my question. Uh, Professor, since we don't do the uh, LP shunt, uh, I'm afraid I can't answer the question. And uh, uh, VP shunt is something that most of the centers do. So here in India, we do uh, VP shunt and LP shunt very rarely when you know there are contraindications for a uh, uh, VP shunt. Oh, okay. So I, I think I agree with you. And for the VP shunt, we are uh, more familiar. But for the LP shunt, I, I'm not. My I, my my colleagues that they did do a do a, a few of the cases, and the for the VP uh, MPH, I, I think they are more prefer. They prefer to use the VP shunt. I I don't know why because. Of, I think VP shunt is, is good, but uh, I don't know. So, sorry, sorry, I, I, I didn't know. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. thank you. Thank you, Professor. So we have another surgeon from other part of the world, from University of Toronto, Dr. Ashish Kumar. So what is, what is the practice followed at your institute and do you perform LP shunt? What is the guidance so, there? Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Sneha. Uh, I mean, this is a topic which I think every neurosurgeon, whether he's in cerebrovascular surgery or he's in skull-based surgery or even a spine surgeon, probably he must have encountered once in a while. Uh, so here, like we do, um, as Professor Soichi said, that we do interrupted like three consecutive days tap and we drain around 50 to 60. We, we go more, uh, sometimes up to 70 cc's of a fluid engine then monitor. And we, we actually monitor with the help of neurology. So I wanted to ask like who monitors the uh, the improvement? Is it you or, or, or you are also having a collaboration with neurology? No, uh, it is just us, we only do. Only when the patient has a severe uh, neurodegenerative disorder, <coughs> they undergo the battery before the Parkinson neuropsychological assessment by a psychologist. Otherwise, uh, it's just the MMSC and gate. Yeah. No, the reason why we do that is just because, you know, um, the second question actually I want to ask first is what, what's your long-term, longest follow-up in these 24 patients? So it's one and a half years now. 
and the last so, patient uh, we followed up is exactly one and a half years doing well and his pressure setting is at 110 so we just had mm -hmm. to reduce it by 10 and he's doing quite well with that because the 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 issue with patients who have you know concomitant uh, uh, problems like parkinsons they they improve initially uh, sometimes mm -hmm. when you see a well, long run then slowly and slowly they come back to their baseline or at least, uh, you know, uh, start to, uh, you know, have more symptoms. So just for the young surgeons, I'll say like, you know, at that point of time where you have, uh, you have documented PD along with it, the counseling becomes very important. Most of the patients, uh, you know, will still go for, uh, uh, you know, a trial because they are already, you know, they have tried everything, but uh, still like, you know, giving that initial time during your you know, when you are talking to the patient about that, this, there are multiple confounding factors and, and, you know, your improvement may not be long lasting or may, you know, uh, plateau after a certain period of time is, is what I do personally here. Uh, again, majority of us do VP shunt here. Programmable is uh, the standard of care because as you said, it avoids uh, uh, second surgery. Um, the the LP shunt. There are a few papers which mention, uh, in, like you know, uh, that it can be done for NPH. But LP shunt, in my opinion, is 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 tricky. It is prone for malfunction. It's prone for displacement. It's prone for uh, multiple revisions. So I, I think like if you have something where the ventricles are so big and and we all like have been trained to do VP shunt right from the beginning. Uh, I think it is more straightforward, is more durable. Uh, but yes, there are evidence in the literature that L patient also works. But here we do B patient only. So uh, that's that's the that's the only comment I'll have. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashish Kumar. Thanks. Are there any other uh, questions or doubts from any of the panelists or attendees? So, if not, uh, then I would request Professor Yokukato to uh, say a few words uh, uh, about the presentation of both uh, Professor Tangji and uh, Dr. Sneha Chitsa before uh, I make one final announcement and we can do the session. Okay. okay, so thank you very much for the two speakers and also the, the chair of Dr. Oya and also uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander and also the president and all the uh, uh, faculty members. Uh, still, I have uh, some doubts for the uh, Tanji uh, about uh, some uh, pathology of the cabinoma, because uh, some uh, cabinoma is very good uh, treated by the radio surgery. So, but most of the case, it does not work. So I, I think maybe some uh, pathological difference, uh, the ABM uh, and the uh, uh, cabinoma. So if you have some uh, some uh, the answer, can you tell us, please? You mean A B? Yes, you. you well, I, I'm asking you. I didn't get your questions. Sorry. Uh, okay, okay. So just I want to know the pathological di differences, histopathology of the in, in between the cavern over and also the AVM because AVM is very good uh, candidate for the radio surgery. But cavern over still, uh, it is unknown. But some mm -hmm. case, it is very, very good, uh, the results with the radio surgery. So that, that's why uh, I ask you. So, so for this kind of the, I think the pathology of the uh, AVM uh, is different from the cavern small formations. And uh, and also we know even if for the cavernous malformation, even there are two kinds of the uh, entities. One is a middle middle fossa, a cavernous sinus cavernous malformation. That is a very very sensitive to the radio surgery, radio therapies. But others in the in the cortex or in uh, brain stems, that is a, a cavernous small formation is not so sensitive to the. So I think the for the pathology is uh, different from the, the. So maybe AVM is uh, uh, to the reducer to the gamma knife, but the cavernous small formation that is not uh, the, the the same. And also uh, from my knowledge, to my knowledge, because in the brainstem, because of the radio surgery to the injury surrounding to, uh, to the injury surrounding the the cavernous, uh, the, the legions, the edemas, 
So that is a very, very sometimes to some extent is dangerous for the gamma knife for the brainstem carbon malformation. So I didn't recommend. And also we should know the uh, the double. Uh, 15 is uh, also from the uh, radio surgery for Japanese uh, radio surgery uh, colleague. They have very good uh, studies. Is a less than the legions should less than 15 milliliters, and the doses is less than 15 degrees. So I I don't know exact uh, the mechanism about uh, the pathologies for these. and uh, maybe in the future I hope I can find the answer for these. Thank you, thank you. For okay, thank you very much. Anyway, uh, very excellent picture. Thanks so much. Congratulations. And also, the Seneha, uh, also, the you uh, does a very nice report. Thank you very much. So, in Japan, we have a three type of the shunt one is a VA shunt and VP shunt already that you mentioned, and also the LP shunt. Mm -hmm. So, according to the, the patient condition, such as uh, some patient has a constipation, it is not good for the VP or LP. And LP is very simple, but some institutes, it's under the local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So no need the general anesthesia. So I, I think uh, that so many uh, conditions of the patient. And also sometimes that the elder people, someone has some problem with the spine, especially the lumbar part. So it's quite difficult to insert of the, that tube. So I think uh, uh, according to the patient's uh, condition, that, but I think uh, a, a bit complicated but the VA shunt is uh, I think one of the best shunt uh, because it's very effective for the patient. Anyway but very nice uh, uh, report and conversation. Thank you very much. So I, I think uh, that today's webinar is uh, organized by Dr. Sachin and Dr. Liu and uh, also Dr. Ashish. Uh, it was really nice that we learned a lot from, uh, from the both speakers and also the commentators. Uh, and also the chairpersons. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you very much. Thank you. So before I close, I wanted to make two announcements that uh, our next webinar will be on uh, in the September 2nd and 4th Sunday. So our next webinar is on 11th of September, same time. And second thing is uh, about the promotion video, our ACNS annual congress will be in Shanghai on October. CNS annual congress. So I request all the young neurosurgeons to send their abstract for the conference. The cutoff date is uh, uh, 31st of August. So we still have a few more days. Please send your abstract and participate in the congress. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, attending the conference. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.